Hey everyone, welcome to another modern deck tech. I'm going to sound a little weird today because I have yet another cold, thanks to my child's daycare. Anyway, so I love Savage Knuckle Blade, and like Tarmogoyf and a select other set of cards, I always try and jam it into a deck in modern and try and make it as viable as possible. So when Charles Asian was spoiled, well, when it was spoiled in Modern Horizons 2, I said, okay, great. Cascade is back. Well, at least it's back in a new form. And I want to build some sort of team or deck with, Shard, Shard, with Savage Knuckle Blade. So I present to you Shardless Knuckle Blade. It's kind of a spin off of the existing teamer, uh, you know, Shardless teamer that we see. Uh, I think everyone's just calling it Rhinos at this point. Um, it's, of course, playing with Savage Knuckle Blade, Shardless Agent, and a few other cool creatures. Before we get there, just a reminder if you haven't already subscribed to this channel, please do. There's a red subscribe button under this uh, video screen. Would really appreciate your support. Uh, you know, even, even if YouTube's, you know, suggesting my videos to you, subscribing goes a really long way. And that notification bell can also help me out a lot, so thank you for that. Okay, the core, or what I consider the core here. So, of course, you have Savage Knuckle Blade. If you don't know about Savage Knuckle Blade, green, blue, red, for 4-4, four, four, it's okay, it's okay. For two colors and a green, it gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. That's great. So you can only do it once, which is, you know, unfortunate. If you had, like, a ton of mana, you couldn't make this huge. It's okay. For two colors and a blue, return it to its owner's hand. You could try and maybe protect it or chump block with it, bring it back. Um, or for one red, Savage Knuckle Blade gains haste until end of turn. That's really the effect that pushes Savage Knuckle Blade to the, to the brink of playability, in my opinion. Because late game, it could help you win board stalls. Comes down, uh, and you can pay that, ex that extra red mana to make give it haste. All of a sudden, you have lethal on the board. I've been playing Savage Knuckle Blade for years, and, you know, I'd say 9 out 8 out of 10 times, um, that's where the utility comes in. Savage Knuckle Blade just comes down, boom, hits your opponent, and it's GG. So, really love playing with him here. I shoved him 4 copies, because I had to, to justify, it, justify the deck name. Then we're playing Charlotte's Agent, which is great. Obviously, it's not going to cascade into Savage Knuckle Blade, but that's okay. Charlotte's Agent's great. I love the fact that it's in modern didn't break anything, it did make crashing footfalls increase in value, which is great because I got them for cheap, but anyway, um, you know, Charlotte's Agent is okay, uh, it's definitely no Blood Braid Elf in, in terms of power level, I suppose, uh, it doesn't have haste, it's a 2-2 as opposed to a 3-2, um, but you know, it, it does the job for what we want to do here, it works really well, I'm also playing Blood Braid Elf and none of the other, or at least not that I've seen, None of the other Charlotte's decks are currently playing Blood Braid Elf, which is understandable because, you know, it kind of limits you on what kind of creatures you want to play. But I'm not going down that strategy with this deck, so I'm fine with Blood Braid Elf, cascading into a Charlotte's Agent, cascading into something else, or even a Blood Braid Elf cascading into Brazen Borrower, which we're going to see next. I'm okay with all of that. It's all value town anyway, so happy with it. And, of course, we're playing four Crashing Footfalls. Well, because who doesn't want to free 4-4 four, four Rhinos with Trample? So, yeah, that's the thing. The other creatures, there's there's more creatures here. Four Bone Crusher Giants and four Brazen Borrowers. So, these are pretty much main, well, I don't know, I, I, they're mainstays in the current Shardless decks. Um, and they still play perfectly fine here. Even with four Blood Braid Elves. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm sick. Uh, it's okay. Like, they... They still do the job here. Bone Crusher Giant, you know, either being a 4 3 beater or dealing 2 damage or both. So that's always nice having some spot removal. Raisin Borrower, you know, kind of acting like a boomerang, just returning any non land permanent to its owner's hands. And of course, it's also a flyer, 3 1 flyer, which is okay. Then you're playing my man, Huntmaster Defels, the other one of the other creatures I was turn, trying to jam into decks. I'm playing two of here. I think two of is perfectly fine. A lot of. People are Huntmaster fans. A lot more people are Huntmaster deniers or, or doubters. You don't you don't know the power level until you play with it. So I'm loving Huntmaster of the Fells in this list. And three subtleties as kind of your creature planeswalker. Um, I wouldn't say removal, more like permission, right? Because that's essentially how it's working. Not necessarily a fan of subtlety, but in a deck like this, it plays better than your other options. So we're playing three of here. You can play around the numbers if you want. The actual factual removal um, is I'm playing four Fire Ice. 
I mean, fire is removal, ice is not. It's more like a cantrip more than anything else. And tapping a permanent can be useful. Um, yeah, these are safe to play in a deck playing Charlotte's Agent or Bloodbraid Elf, so this is why you see it here. Again, it's one of the better options you have when you're playing a Cascade deck. Violent Outburst is the rest. <laughs> There's really not too many that cards outside of creatures in this deck. So Violent Outburst is just yet another Cascade trigger. Uh, at 3 CMC to try and hit your Rhinos as much as possible. So, this is not, nothing, nothing crazy here, nothing, you know, revolutionary. Uh, most of the Charlotte's decks are also playing for a Violent Outburst, and nothing changes in, in this particular deck. Then you have the lands. Um, again, more or less standard. Um, you really want to get your three colors as quickly as possible. You have a Ketra Triome which is a perfectly safe turn one, even turn two fetch. Um, even though it's coming to play tapped, it's okay. You're not doing much for the first few turns. Uh, and everything else pretty much is standard here. This is the mana base that I stuck with till the end. I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, this is what I would suggest for this list. The sideboard always in flux. So, again, I have to be careful what cards I chose for this list, uh, for the sideboard, because of the cascade. Now, generally speaking, uh, if I'm bringing in Force of Negation or Ashiok Dream Render, um, you know, even Anger of the Gods, I'm probably going to be removing a Bloodbraid Elf, just so I don't have to deal with those awkward Cascades. Mostly for Force of Negation. Force of Negation would be the worst one. Everything else, I mean, and Anger of the Gods, obviously. Everything else is okay. It's all cards that could hit the battlefield, and then you can, you know, use them for whatever their abilities are. Alpine Moon as well. Really good for hitting, um, you know, specific types of decks without hosing your own deck. Because even though we're playing three-color teamer here, Blood Moon's not really an option. Um, Seal of Primordium to get rid of artifacts and enchantments. Again, if you cascade into this, not really a big deal. Force Negation, like I said, if you want to switch to a more permission style, game two and game three. Um, this is actually a pretty good option when you're playing against combo decks, for example. Um... Ashok Dream Render, of course, for graveyard strategies and combo decks as well. And Anger of the Gods, of course, for go wide strategies. And the matchups, again, <laughs> apologize for the cold, um, but I push through no matter what, right? Um, combo. So, again, you don't have many answers to combo in the main. You are a tad slow for the combo that we're seeing today. So you're going to be okay if the combo, you know, stutters a bit or if you get some good removal early on or some good bounce effects early on or if it's some tap effects early on to slow down your combo opponent in game one, you could probably steal a win. If not, game two, your sideboard comes in, your Bloodbraid Elf will most likely come out. You don't really need them anyway. Force of Negation will play a bigger role. Um, even Ashok Dreamender could play a bigger role because you're milling cards and then exiling them, getting of, you know, ideally getting rid of important pieces, uh, and your your matchup improves. But I wouldn't say this is a matchup you want to be playing with all the time because again, you don't have many options. Um, now, of course, if you didn't play Bloodbraid Elf, you could have just played more permission in the main. But I decided to have that package in the sideboard, and you can have a wider permission package in the sideboard as well if you feel you could, you know, you could handle the space. Aggro decks. Well, once your engine starts going, aggro decks will have an issue with you. The problem is if you, for whatever reason, keep a weak hand, you don't draw well, aggro decks will catch up uh, and will t overtake you, and it's going to be very hard for you to come back. Um, but again, you do have big creatures that can come down as early as turn three, um, and once you do start getting the ball rolling, you just have big butts that your opponents are going to have issues dealing with. Um, but again, it, it really depends. It's going to be a race. Games 2 and Game 3 could bring in some removal on the sideboard to take care of the go-wide strategies. Uh, but it's more or less going to be the same game plan, whether it's Game 1 or Game 3. Control decks. So, this is a tough one, especially because they have plenty of permission in the main. But they also have a lot of tools in the sideboard to deal with your Rhinos. Luckily, I mean, unlike a lot of the other Shardless decks, you're not heavily relying on on your crashing footfalls here. Savage Knuckle Blade can, you know, pull its weight. Unmastered of Fells can pull its weight. Well, pull its weight. Even Bloodbraid Elf can pull its weight. So, um, slightly less concerning if they bring in Chalice on zero. Um, you know, because you have other targets for your Cascade spells. 
not the biggest, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, I think you could deal per with permission or control decks pretty well. You just have to work around their counters. They're going to be hyper focused on you not getting your rhinos, and I think that's going to be to their detriment because again, you have other creatures that can just, you know, plow through them and give them a lot of trouble, and they're not going to be ready for it. So, um, yeah, ideally in game one, they don't even see Savage Knuckle Blade or Hunt Master or anything like that, uh, and they just see Charlotte's Agent, and then they they side incorrectly. That'll be even to your bigger benefit. Mid-range decks, so um, similar, I would say, to the aggro decks here. Now, mid-range decks are a tad slower, uh, which is going to be to your benefit. But again, you got to really hit your land drops. You got to really hit your, you know, your your creature spells, your cascade spells when you want to on curve. Um, if not, mid-range is going to grind you out. But again, you have a lot of creatures here. It's not just four-four trampling rhinos that you need to win the game. Um, so you could do a lot better. Savage Knuckle Blade, believe it or not, is kind of a conundrum for a lot of the mid-range decks. So I think you're okay. There's a lot of, uh, you know, removal you can bring in from the sideboard, especially if you're playing Stone Blade decks. You might want to change your sideboard accordingly to deal with those type of decks, depending on your meta. So I don't think mid-range decks are the worst in the world. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think you just got to play intelligently and you could, you could win most of those games. Big mana decks, Tron decks. Um, again, in the main, you don't have much to deal with what they're doing. You could bring in uh, removal from the side to deal. You, know, you could bring in Alpine Moon, for example, to turn off their Tron. Uh, you could bring in Artifact Removal, depending on the variant of Tron that you're playing. Subtlety will take care of their Planeswalkers. Again, it's more or less a race, and I think you could pretty much win that race most of the time, give them a lot of trouble, but again, you got to be careful if they're playing Wormcoil Engine, that's going to be an issue you're going to have to deal with. It's not easy for this deck to deal with cards like Wormcoil Engine and what happens to it when it gets destroyed. So, yeah, I wouldn't say it's your best matchup, but I think you can deal with it with enough practice with this deck. Last but not least, Borderline Magic. Again, uh, it really depends on your opponent, I guess, and how much they super focus on Charlotte's Agent and turning off your Rhinos. Borderline Magic is always a flip of the, uh, you know, flip of the coin. I wouldn't say it's any better or worse with this deck. Um, you know, for mill decks, I think you're fine, generally speaking. You're not too concerned. You know, you have creatures that could beat down on them. Um, for Dredge, uh, you know, you probably have an upper hand if they are a bit slow. If they have the nuts and they go off turn two, then, I mean, you're screwed. But if they're a bit slower, turn three, turn four, or whatever it is, you could start cascading into things, resolving things that they're going to have issues dealing with, and you could probably deal with Dredge actually um, relatively well, which is a rare thing for me to say since I, I generally don't like Dredge in general. And Lantern Control, yeah, I mean, in Staring Bridge, you just have to take care of in Staring Bridge. That's really the only card you need to worry about. As long as you could get rid of in Staring Bridge, uh, your Lantern of Control, a Lantern of yeah, Lantern of Control will have very little to do against you. And that's it for the matchups. That's it for Shardless Knuckle Blade. Um, if you're a Knuckle Blade fan, let me know in the comment section down below. Let me know what you think about this deck in general. There's going to be three matches going up today, so stay tuned for those if you want to see how this deck plays in comparison to just standard Shardless decks. And yes, the commentary in those matches will also be grainy like this with my voice because, like I said, I'm trying to kick this cold. But the schedule must go on. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, I would love to hear from you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you enjoy my content in general, please subscribe and hit that notification bell. It really goes a long way to help me out a lot. If you want to become a member here on YouTube, hit that join button, which should be in and around that subscribe button. Check out the different membership tiers and the different perks you get at each tier. You know, I would love to have you as part of my YouTube community officially as a member. And I think the membership tiers uh, are pretty interesting, have some cool little features in there. So check it out, I would really appreciate your support. Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, share my content on social media, watch my content start to finish like you're doing right now. It really does go a long way, so thank you for that. Lastly, if you want to become a patron, check out the Patreon link in the description of this video. Check out the Patreon Rewards Program. In a nutshell, you give me money every month. I use that money to buy a sealed product, which I open up on this channel, and then I give you back that money in the form of rares and mythics at the end of every year. The longer you're a patron, the more rares and mythics you get. Basically, one rare mythic for every month that you're a patron. And the value of those rares are anything really between $3 and $15. Some of them go even higher, as you know. 
So even if you average out about five a month, five dollars per rare, that's five a month. You get your money back, but odds are you'll make more. Anyway, all that information is on Patreon. There's a video on there that explains it all. We really appreciate your support. Either way, thanks and have a good one.